The Federation is on the verge of collapse. After three people disappear into the mysterious portals that hold the Empire together, Kulan Penrose is called in to investigate. After he discovers that the ancient gate system is crumbling, he orders them to be shut down. The druids oppose Penrose's plans, and soon Kulan discovers that something is out to destroy him and plunge the Empire into an age of darkness. Can Kulan's science save magic before it destroys him? Or will his magic save the science of the Gale Gates? Beyond Time Chapter 1 Yawning, Apprentice Ewan Gutrard peered toward the hilltop, the night sky brilliant beyond the henge. The lack of moon leaving the stars all the brighter. Crickets chirped at regular rhythm. The night birds called out for mates. A chill wind blew him the scents of grass, flowers, and trees. Five large trilathons surrounded by thirty smaller trilathons made up the inner circle of Stonehenge on Alcyon. All the thirty-five post and lintel structures built with the native sarsen stone. Four stones stood at the edge of the ring, marking the monument boundaries, a station stone to each the east and west, a slaughter stone to the south, and a heel stone to the north. Gnomes supposedly ruled these domains, Stonehenge their home. Ewan had never seen them and didn't expect to. A disciple of elemental air, he studied the sylphs, his skill at summoning them meager as yet. Not the most exciting of duties, the vigil at Stonehenge was taken by turns one night out of every fortnight. The apprentices disliking the duty almost as much as serving the slop. Standing beside the slaughter stone, Ewan pulled his cape tighter, trying to keep his senses alert. These night vigils, especially difficult in the cold, when all a body wanted to do was sleep. He jerked his head back to attention, his eyelids desperately wanting to close. Atop the hill, Stonehenge was outlined by the blue brilliance of several sisters, the Pleiades constellation, all young stars, none more than two hundred million years old, their multiple suns giving them mutual light to their siblings' planets at all hours the surface of Alcyon bathed in blue. Perched atop the largest trilithon, the main gate lintel easily twelve feet long, was Sister Plion, the pulsating star like a beacon marking the gate. Ewan pinched his eyes shut as though to squeeze the sleep from them, then stifled another yawn. A wrath slipped from the main gate, and then was gone. A gnome, he wondered. Nothing else moved. Had he actually seen something, or was it an afterimage? An elemental, perhaps. Proctor, you awake? He asked on his calm. What is it, Lo? Madrat's voice was groggy with sleep. Thought I saw something come out of the main gate, but then it was gone. Wasn't it a ghost on the inside of your eyelids, was it, lad? Don't think so, sir. He might have taken umbrage at Proctor Madrout for implying he'd been asleep. Ewan continued to scan the area, seeing nothing untoward. The crickets chirped, 
The night birds called and the wind blew. A few minutes later, Proctor Madrout joined Ewan, still shrugging on his tunic. Leon thrives brightly tonight, I see. Shall we? He gestured Ewan to take the lead. The apprentice stepped over the invisible barrier they all knew was the ring. Stonehenge was sacred ground, never to be entered unless necessary, and never alone. The grass inside the ring was even cut, remaining green throughout the year, always standing three inches exactly, maintained, it was said, by an invocation to the mythical Gwitin. The hen stood atop a knoll that was so even, round, and symmetrical that geologic forces couldn't have formed it. Ewan led the way, keeping a sharp gaze on the main gate, the dewy grass soon dampening his sodhoppers. The circular stand of trilithons comprising Stonehenge seemed menacing tonight, where during the day it stood sentinel over their domains like an ancient guardian god. Nothing looked out of place as they approached the main gate, the south one. Three other slightly narrower gates at east, west, and north also looked empty. Immediate gates in between, varying in height all the way down to half that of the main gate, stood quiescent as well. No sign to Ewan that any had been used in the last few minutes. Do you see that? Proctor Madrout asked his stare fixed to the main gate's lintel, a foot-thick slab ten feet long and two feet deep. How the ancients had lifted it eighteen feet above the ground was an enigma. See what, Proctor? Ewan extended his senses, as he'd been taught, seeing with not just his eyes, but with his entire being. There, a spark. At head height, in the center of the gate, a dim aura, a slight warming, as though someone's passage had left a wrath of the person's presence. A spark, Madrout said. Yes, faint, but there. It's nothing, the proctor suddenly said, shaking his head. You were sleeping again, Lou. This time he did not take umbrage. I wasn't, I swear. You were, and you know it, and you're to serve the slop until the next turn at vigil. But that's two weeks, he protested. Would you like it a month? Madrout turned and descended the hill, leaving Ewan gasping in his wake like a fish out of water. Serving slop in the kitchen for two weeks would subject him to the colony of his peers. They'd all exorciate him. Further, it'd be the last time anyone would wake Proctor. Fat lot of good vigil at the Henge would do their enclave if none of the sentinels raised the alarm. It wasn't how Ewan would run things. His back to the main gate, he watched contemptuously as Madrout made his way down the hill and across the ring, leaving Ewan inside the ring alone. A surreal force seized Ewan's shoulders and yanked him backward into the gate. Yeah.